everyone and welcome to another video in the Sewing Through the Decade series. Today's video is going to be a little bit different than the previous ones in the series since instead of moving on into a different decade I'm going to be revisiting or continuing to visit depending on how you look at it the 1930s. I promised over on Patreon and when I first started this project that if it got enough support then I'd be able to take on bonus projects for each decade. We've officially hit that point. So today I'm following another pattern from the 1930s in a very different style by a very different brand. So instead of making something roughly and gathered with a capelet and a flouncy skirt, I'm making something a lot more structured. I feel like this style is still very iconically 1930s, though it's really dramatically different from the previous 1930s project that I made. This pattern is by Pictorial Review and it is number 6105. It consists of two pieces, including the blouse, which I'm currently wearing, and what they call a jumper, which is worn over top. It's basically a very slim cut dress with kick pleats at the hem, and these really interesting panels at the side that button up. Overall, I really like the design of this, and I really like how it turned out, but there were a couple complications when making it. I actually found the instructions on this to be very confusing, which I was very prized at because this is actually the first printed pattern in this series which means there were illustrations and markings and lines and all sorts of helpful information printed onto the pattern pieces themselves. Which you'd think would avoid a lot of the confusion that I've had with the vintage patterns thus far, but it definitely did not. Luckily most of those struggles took place on the mock-up so you're not really going to see them in this video, but trust me, they happened. <laughs> Before getting into the assembly, I just wanted to thank all of my lovely patrons. They're the reason I've been able to create this series and continue creating videos. And now I'm just going to go ahead and get into it, and I really hope you enjoy! So as I said, today I'm following Pictorial Review 6105. This is the second Pictorial Review pattern I've followed in this series, and unfortunately it was just as confusing as the first. It's in a size 14, made for a 32 inch bust, and they describe it as being a woman's and junior's frock with a separate blouse. The jumper departs from the usual thing in this frock by the extensions of the underarm, which are closed with link buttons. Blouse has an intriguing collar and puff sleeves. Side sections of skirt form pleats. It's also a printed pattern, though what is printed differs pretty dramatically from modern patterns. They've left things like gathers and grain lines marked with perforations. They've just printed numbers onto the pieces along with actual assembly instructions. Not all assembly instructions, just some of them. <laughs> so you have to jump between the information on the tissue and the sparse instruction sheet, which is also printed on tissue. The additional information is definitely helpful in certain ways, but makes it more confusing to piece together. I definitely prefer the perforated pieces and more thorough page instructions, but that could just be me. For fabrics, they chose to recommend everything from linen to gingham to crepe to cotton, and I chose to take some of their suggestions. I bought a red linen for the jumper, and for the blouse I picked a lightweight patterned cotton. Both of these were purchased from Joann's and washed prior to cutting and assembling my frock. I love how it's called a frock. It reminds me of Downton Abbey. I started by laying out the cotton and the pieces for the blouse. The blouse consists of a mere five pieces, a front panel, a back panel, a piece for the collar, along with the puffed sleeve piece and a cuff. When I made my mock-up, I discovered this was too small for me. Not surprising, considering this is made for a 32 inch bust, so I'm adding at least an inch of extra allowance to all the pieces, and more than two inches to the sleeves, to improve the puff factor and, you know, make them fit my arms, which is an important aspect of sleeves. I also cut out a few one and a half inch wide strips of bias binding to neatly finish the slash at the front and the raw edges from the collar. They have five whole instructions relating to the blouse, the first of which is cutting a slash down the front. Then they say, make darts in front of blouse F. So I'm marking those, then removing the pattern pieces and pinning the darts into position. If you're interested about the markings on the pattern, they just describe what the perforations are. So it suggests the grain line to cut it on, as well as where to lengthen or shorten the panel. And then it says that in French too, but I can barely pronounce things in English, so let's not attempt that. Now I could pin the bias cut strip around the slash at the center front. I sewed this on with the right sides facing each other and a quarter inch seam allowance. 
I ironed the binding until it turned over the raw edge nicely. Then it was pinned in place. This was surprisingly difficult since I was using an eyelet look fabric that had a bunch of holes in it, so it did not want to iron smoothly. Eventually I managed, but I really would not recommend this fabric. The binding was all stitched down by hand using whip stitches. They actually have more thorough instructions for this step, in which they recommend an 1 8 of an inch seam allowance, but given the holy nature of this fabric, I didn't think that was a good idea. And the print means the binding blends in well, regardless of the width. Now I stitch the panels together at the underarm and shoulders, which is still part of the first assembly instruction. And I'm pinning and sewing these pieces with the wrong sides facing each other, then trimming the allowance, ironing the seam, and repinning it so the right sides are facing each other, and stitching it once again. This creates a tidy French seam with all the raw edges tucked away. They recommend overlocking the seams, which in the 1930s meant whip stitching the edges down by hand, or turning the raw edge inward and top stitching it down. Both are valid, but I like this way better. And after another round of ironing, that is it for the base of the bodice. My joy over making a blouse that doesn't require half dozen bound buttonholes is truly indescribable. Trust me, you will feel my frustration more on that one as we get into the 1940s. But we still have to make the collar and the sleeves. The collar is a single piece which is pinned in half lengthwise with the right sides facing each other. I stitched across the ends, then trimmed the corners and turned it right side out. Their way of describing this is, fold collar H through center lengthwise and close seams at ends. Turn and press, sew neck with front edges even. I like how they refer to it by piece number and by the fact it's a collar, so you don't get it confused with all the other pieces which are way too large to be collars. Actually, I shouldn't discriminate. Anything can be a collar, I guess. It would just look really, really bad. <laughs> I pinned the collar on, then stitched it on by machine. They don't address how to finish this edge, so I chose to stitch bias binding onto the seam allowance by machine. This was folded over the raw edges and pinned down. Then I sewed across this edge by hand, which might sound tedious, but it took half the time of a single bound buttonhole, so I'm still grateful for this entire blouse making process. I also decided to take this time to hand sew the hem. They don't mention the hem at all, so I chose to turn it inward by half inch twice so all the raw edges were nicely tucked away. Then I whip stitched it down. Now for the sleeves. Interestingly, the entire lower edge of these is gathered, which is highly unusual. Usually with puffed sleeves, the portion under the arm isn't gathered and offers support for the rest of the sleeve. But this has 360 degrees of poof, which I 360% approve of. This was actually really good for me to know since I'm in the process of drafting a puffed sleeve 1930s black. I love it when I learn something from these vintage patterns that I can incorporate into my own designs. That was kind of the whole point of this series in the first place. I gathered the lower edge by hand using small running stitches pulled taut, and as they suggested, I gathered the entire edge except for the seam allowance since that part isn't necessary. Once it was gathered down to the length of the cuff, I tied off my thread and pinned them together. Now they say, sew sleeve band K to sleeve, close seam of sleeve and band, fell sleeve band over seam. To accomplish that, these were pinned with the right sides facing each other, then stitched on with a half inch allowance. Then I straightened the cuff and sewed the side seams up, and once again I did this as a French seam to avoid fraying. Then the cuff is rolled inward and the raw edges are tucked away, until there's an even 1 inch band around the bottom of the sleeves. And this was also whip stitched into position. The sleeves had several points which were intended to be matched with the arm side, so I lined those up and pinned the lower portion of the sleeves into place. Then I gathered the top portion until it nicely fit in the arm side. This isn't what they told me to do. What they actually wanted me to do was gather the top of the sleeve between the notches, then pin it in the armhole with the perforations matching. But it's hard to gauge what you should gather it down to, so I like gathering the sleeves down when they are partially pinned in place. 
I don't do this with huge balloon sleeves or anything, but for lightly gathered sleeves, I think this is a fantastic method. The sleeves are sewn on by machine, and I finish the raw edges with lace binding. And that's it for the blouse. So we're one garment down, but we still have to make the jumper. I also made some alterations when cutting this out. Once again, based on the fact that this was two sizes too small for me and my penchant for French seams, which require additional seam allowance. But since I wanted to preserve the integrity of the pattern, I didn't do any fancy grading. I just added to the center back and center front and side seams. I went ahead and marked the perforations on the front and back panels for the frock, then removed the pattern pieces. Step one for assembly is closing the shoulder seams of the front and back panels, which I did by machine using a half inch allowance. Then they wanted me to make the bound buttonholes in the side, but I didn't do that. I decided to bind the raw edges first so they wouldn't fray while I was working on the buttonholes. To do this, I first cut several lengths of one inch wide binding on the fabric's bias. These strips were all sewn together, ironed, and pinned around the arm opening and neckline. I actually pinned one portion at a time, sewing in between, since I wanted to avoid pricking myself on the large quantity of pins that were required to form the binding to the edges. And I believe I used a quarter inch allowance when sewing this. I used my iron to form the binding around the curves and to turn it inward. I also tucked the raw edges inward so it was nicely finished on the interior. This is a pretty basic flat bias finish, which they actually have a diagram for on the pattern instructions. So I assume they intend for me to use that technique here, but they never actually mention finishing these edges at any point in the instructions. After all the binding was pinned on, I stitched it on by hand using whip stitches. And now I could make the buttonholes, except they also want me to face the underarms, which should really be done first in my opinion. Then again, in my opinion, they should also include a pattern for the facing so it is clear how big it should be, but they don't do that either. So I drafted them myself using the front and back frock panels as a guide. I ironed the long edge of these inward, then pinned the shorter edge onto the frock with the right sides facing each other. This was sewn with a half inch allowance. And now I could finally start on the buttonholes. They didn't mention the placement of these at all, so I made that up too. But I did know there were supposed to be three on each side, which is something. <laughs> Weirdly, the instructions for these are on the side panel of the skirt, which we haven't even used yet. But they say, mark buttonholes with small basting. Cut a bias or straight strip of material. Arrange on outside of garment with right sides of material facing each other and center of material along buttonhole basting. Stitch 1 8th of an inch around all basting. I'm marking mine with chalk and using a wider than recommended strip of material to back them, but I did sew around all of my markings with the suggested 1 8th of an inch allowance. I trim the strip down and then cut along the centers of each buttonhole and diagonally into the corners. The buttonhole facing was brought through the opening and ironed slash folded slash basted slash pinned until it nicely covered the opening. You basically want it to fold over the raw edges of the buttonhole, like binding, with the folds meeting in the exact center of the buttonhole. Then you can use pins or basting stitches or a combination of the two to keep it looking pretty until it's time to line it. Now the facing we stitched on earlier can be turned inward to cover the backs of the bound buttonholes. Or in the case of the back panels that don't have buttonholes, they cover the raw edges. I stitched all of these down by hand. Then I made slashes in the facing directly underneath the buttonholes. All the raw edges were turned inward and stitched down. This secures the lining to the buttonhole binding and keeps the binding in position. At this point, any pins and basting stitches can be removed. <laughs> 
Now I could finally work with the side panels. These were removed from their tissue, then I marked lines two inches away from the inner edges. The fabric was folded and ironed inward at these lines, and inward by half inch across the top edge. And this was repeated for both the back and the front side panels. Then I marked a line two inches away from the side edges of the front and back panels and pinned the side panels over top. In the instructions, they describe this as, turn front edges of section C under and baste. Baste under 3 eighths of an inch on upper edges. Lap on front A, draw and gathers to fit, and stitch as far as center medium perforations. Close seams underneath pleats. Join back sections B and D in the same manner as A and C. Here you can see me following those steps for the back panels. The middle perforations they are talking about are where the top stitching ends and the skirt flares out into an open pleat. These are usually called kick pleats and are still found today in modern fitted skirts. I found these lined up quite well and the top stitching was easy to do on the linen. However, the front panels are a bit trickier. They say gather front to fit upper edge of side panel, but the front panel is actually the exact same size as the side panel. So this is like really confusing, but I think I did it right. The side panels need to extend past the front panels to allow for the side seams, so the front panels gather down by an inch or two. Then everything is pinned together and stitched as you would expect. By close seams underneath the pleats, they mean close the portion that isn't top stitched into position, which is the bottom 15 or so inches. But I chose to finish the entire length of these edges using lace binding to avoid fraying later on. Then I pin these side edges together with the wrong sides of the frock facing each other so I can, you guessed it, sew this with French seams. However, I did leave the top six or so inches of the left side seam open to allow for a placket closure later on. After the side seams were sewn, ironed, trimmed, sewn, and ironed again, I went ahead and cut out the wider strips of bias binding to use for the placket. On this pattern, they called for a continuous lap closure. They don't describe how to do it, but that's what they want you to do. And this is actually done by pinning a continuous, do you get it now, piece of binding to the right side of the frock. This is stitched on by machine on one side is turned completely inward to create a flat bias finish. Then on the other side, I pinned the binding over the raw edge like a typical bias binding finish. The flat biased edge will lap over the other edge and close with hooks or snaps. And of course, the binding is stitched down by hand. Plackets are one of my least favorite parts of mid-century sewing, but it is kind of nice that closures didn't distract from the design by being placed on the center front or center back. However, if I made this again, I would probably put a zipper down the back instead. I feel like the bulkiness of the linen binding at the side takes away from the overall shape, and I would have been able to improve the fit by a lot if I was using a zipper to close it instead of a mixture of snaps and buttons. Now it's time for closures. They don't really mention these anywhere in the instructions, but on the pattern envelope themselves, when they talk about notions, they call for several small hooks and bars. I started sewing these in, but ended up removing them after fitting, where I realized that my skirt wasn't fitted enough to put enough tension on the hooks and loops to keep them hooked and looped together. So I ended up removing them and replacing them with snaps instead. The final step was adding buttons. I opted for these one inch wide vintage white buttons and I think they are the perfect touch. However, they aren't shank buttons, so I made sure to leave a pretty long tail when I was sewing them on. By this point, most of you have probably accepted that the dress is complete, but there might be one or two of you that are wondering about the hem. I actually ended up stitching that off camera the morning before I filmed a cooking video whilst wearing this dress. But it was a simple hem, I just turned the bottom edge inward by a half inch, then inward by three inches, and catch stitched it down. You'll see me do the exact same thing in the next video in this series. I also opted not to make the belt. I found it was way too wide to be flattering and hid the button detailing at the sides. So I wore it with a vinyl belt from the 1940s instead. I also paired this ensemble with some matching shoes, which I bought from Royal Vintage. 
Overall, I really like how these pieces turned out. I feel like they're pieces I will actually wear and enjoy having in my wardrobe and be able to style in a variety of different ways. I think I might take it in a little bit at the sides so it is more fitted through the hips as shown on their patented pictograph. But other than that, I really like this and it makes me want to attempt more pieces from the 1930s. Speaking of the 1930s, I have a few other videos with that theme that will be posted very soon, so if that interests you, then you should subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, then giving it a like and a comment really helps me out. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I will talk to all of you very soon.